Hey guys, Spiderivative Man, back talking to you about AP questions involving derivatives. Now here's a question. What crime did Doc Ock commit at the bank? Armed robbery. Question one says the graphs of f and g are shown below. If h of x is equal to f of x times g of x, then h prime of six is equal to what? So we have a graph of f of x and g of x, and it gives us that h of x is actually equal to f of x times g of x. And it wants us to find the derivative of our function h at x is equal to six. So this is actually testing your knowledge of the product rule because it's asking you to take the derivative of your function h of x which is actually equal to a function times a function. So when you take the derivative of a function times another function, you have to use the product rule. So the product rule says, if I wanna take the derivative of h of x, it's gonna be h prime of x is equal to the derivative of the first function, f prime of x times the second function, g of x, plus the first function, f of x, times the derivative of the second function, g prime of x. Now, we have successfully taken the derivative of h of x, we then need to find h prime prime of six. So all we have to do then is plug in six for each of our x's here. Now we evaluate each of these individually. So f prime of six, it wants you to find the slope of the function f at x is equal to six. So we look over here at x is equal to one, two, three, four, five, six. We see that the slope of our f function right here, we go down two, right one, down two, right one. So that's going to be slope of negative two. So we're going to plug in negative two for f prime of six. Now what is g of six? That's just the y value of our g function at x is equal to six. So we go over to x is equal to six again. What is the y value of our g function? That's going to be four. So we plug in four for g of six. What is f of six? That's the y value of our f function at x is equal to six. So the y value of our f function at x is equal to six, that would be two. So we're going to plug in two for f of six. And then g prime of six is the slope of our g function at x is equal to six. So we go over to x is equal to six. What is the slope of our g function? function up here. Well, it looks like it's going down one, right two, down one, right two. So that's a slope of negative one half. We then simplify negative two times four is going to be negative eight. Two times negative one half is just negative one. Add these together, you get negative nine. So h prime of six has to equal negative nine. So a is your answer. Now question two says the height above the ground of a passenger on a Ferris wheel t minutes after the ride begins is modeled by the differentiable function h, where h of t is measured in meters. Which of the following is an interpretation of the statement h prime of 7.5 is equal to 15.708? So h of t is referring to the height above the ground of a passenger on a Ferris wheel t minutes after the ride begins. That means that h prime of t would be the rate of change of the height above the ground of the passenger on a Ferris wheel t minutes after the ride begins. So this statement right here is saying that the rate of change of the height of the passenger above the ground 7.5 minutes after the ride begins, because 7.5 is our t, is 15.708. Now, this is measured in meters and minutes. So this would be 15.708 meters per minute. So let's look at which one of these gives us that. Part A says the Ferris wheel is turning at a rate of 15.708 meters per minute when the passenger is 7.5 meters above the ground. So this is wrong for two reasons. One, the 15.708 is referring to the rate of change of the height of the passenger above the ground, not the rate at which the Ferris wheel is turning. So that's wrong. And 7.5 is referring to the time after the ride begins, not the height above the ground. So that's wrong. Choice B says the Ferris wheel is turning at a rate of 15.708 meters per minute, 7.5 minutes after the ride begins. So we said already that 15.708 is referring to the rate of change of the height of the passenger above the ground, not the rate at which the Ferris wheel is turning. So that is wrong. But at least they got 7.5 minutes right this time. Choice C says the passenger's height above the ground is increasing by 15.708 meters per minute. Okay, that's right. When the passenger is 7.5 meters above the ground. No, 7.5 we said was the time. So it's 7.5 minutes after the ride begins. So part C, so close, but not right. Choice D, the passenger's height above the ground is increasing by 15.708 meters per minute. Yes, that is right. 7.5 minutes after the ride begins. Yes, 7.5 is our T. 15.708 is the rate of change of the passenger's height above the ground. Therefore, choice D is the correct answer. 
And now just because we can, let's look at what part E was referring to. It says the passenger is 15.708 meters above the ground, 7.5 minutes after the ride begins. So this choice is actually just using the original function. It's plugging in 7.5 for T and giving you the height above the ground of the passenger. But we wanted H prime of T, not H of T, which is what this is giving you. Question three says a particle moves along a straight line with a velocity given by V of T is equal to five plus E to the T over three for time T is greater than or equal to zero. What is the acceleration of the particle at time T equals four? So this question is just testing your knowledge of the relationship between velocity and acceleration. We want the acceleration of the particle at time t equals four, but we're given the velocity. So how do we get the acceleration function from the velocity function? You just take the derivative. So we need to take the derivative of our velocity function. Now to take the derivative of this, we need to take the derivative of each term separately. So we start by taking the derivative of five with respect to time. So the derivative of a constant is just gonna be zero. The derivative of e to the t over three we have a function within a function. So this is going to require the chain rule. The chain rule says you need to take the derivative of your outer function and leave your inner function alone and then multiply that by the derivative of your inner function. Notice that our inner function here is t over 3. Our outer function is going to be e to the something. So e to this t over 3. So when we take the derivative of our outer function and leave the inner function alone, it's going to be e to the t over 3, the exact same thing. But then we have to multiply by the derivative of of t over 3. Now this looks complicated, but t over 3 is the same thing as 1 third times t. So what we can do by the constant multiple rule is just take that 1 third and move it out front and multiply it on at the end and just take the derivative of t. What's the derivative of t with respect to t? That's just 1. So 1 third times 1 then gives you 1 third, which we then multiply to the e to the t over 3 and we get e to the t over 3 over 3. Now, what did we just find? We just found the derivative of the velocity function, which is the acceleration function. Now, all we have to do to find the acceleration of the particle at time t equals 4 is plug in 4 for t in the acceleration function. So if we take 4, plug it in for t, plug this in our calculator, we get approximately 1.265, which we look over here is choice C. Now question four says, let f be the function defined by f of x is equal to x cubed plus x squared plus x. Let g of x equal f inverse of x, where g of three is equal to one. What is the value of g prime of three? So this question wants you to find the derivative of the function g at x is equal to three. And we look, the function g is just the inverse of the function f. So it basically just wants you to find the derivative of the inverse of f. So we need to remember, what is the derivative of the inverse formula? Well, if you recall, the derivative of the inverse formula is one over f prime of f inverse of x. So we then are finding g prime of three, the derivative of the inverse function at x is equal to three. So we're gonna plug in three for each of these x's here. Now, is there anything else that could help us simplify this a little bit more? Well, f inverse of three, we know f inverse is the same as g, and we already know g of three. So instead of writing f inverse of three, we're going to say that it's g of 3 because those two things are equal to each other. And we know that g of 3 is equal to 1. So instead of g of 3, we can just plug in 1. So now all we have to do to find g prime of 3 or f inverse prime of 3 is evaluate 1 over f prime of 1. So f prime, I need to find the derivative of my function f. So how do I find the derivative of the function f? I just take the derivative of this function and use the power rule for each of these. Derivative of x cubed is going to be 3x squared. The derivative of x squared is going to be 2x to the first and the derivative of x is just going to be 1. So now I'm going to take this f prime that I just found and evaluate f prime of 1. So I just plug in 1 for each of these x's. I then simplify and I end up getting 1 over 6. So f inverse prime of 3 or g prime of 3, they mean the exact same thing, is equal to 1 over 6. So 1 over 6 is going to be my answer. Now question five says evaluate the limit as h approaches zero of e to the negative one minus h minus e to the negative one all over h. Now this question is testing your knowledge on the definition of the derivative of a function at a particular x value c. Now, if you recall, the definition of the derivative uses the limit process, and it looks something like this. If we're taking the derivative of a function at a particular point, a particular x value c, we have the limit as h approaches zero of f of c plus h minus f of c all over h, where c is the x value you want to take the derivative at. Now, the question is, what is my function and what is my c value? 
Well, notice that our function looks like it should be e to the something. The question then is, what is our c value? Well, you would initially think, oh, my c value is negative 1. But this says c plus h. But this is negative 1 minus h. That means that I have to factor out a negative 1 here. So it's going to be e to the negative, parentheses, 1 plus h minus e to the negative, parentheses, 1 all over h. Now I can see that my function that I'm taking the derivative of, my f, is actually e to the negative x. And I'm taking the derivative at x is equal to 1. So again, my function is going to be e to the negative x. My x value, my c value, at which I'm taking the derivative of my function is 1. So this whole thing, this limit right here, is just asking you, what is the derivative? of e to the negative x at x is equal to 1. So all you have to do is just take the derivative of e to the negative x and then plug in 1. So what is the derivative of e to the negative x? Well, this requires the chain rule because you have a function within a function. So we're going to take the derivative of e to the something, our outer function, which is just e to that same something. So it's going to be e to the negative x times the derivative of negative x, which is just negative 1. So we get negative e to the negative x. Now when we evaluate this at x is equal to 1, we just plug in 1 for x, and we simplify. Negative e to the negative 1 is the same thing. If we want to write that with a positive exponent, we can write it as negative 1 over e. And we look over here, yes, that is choice b, so we're done. Now question 6 says let f be the function defined above which of the following statements about f are true. So we're going to take this one by one and determine which of these are true. So this first part, we're trying to determine if the limit as x approaches 1 from the left of f of x is equal to the limit as x approaches 1 from the right of f of x. So this is just asking us to plug in 1 for each of these parts of the piecewise function and figure out if we get the same y value coming in from the left that we do coming in from the right. So does this part of the piecewise function at x equals 1 equal this part of the piecewise function at x equals 1? So let's plug in 1 for each of these and then figure out if the y values match up. So if we plug in 1 for each of these and we simplify, we end up getting 1 is equal to the ln of 1, which is 0. So 1 clearly does not equal 0. Therefore, the limit as x approaches 1 from the left of f of x does not equal the limit as x approaches 1 from the right of f of x, because the y values do not match up. Part two, we want to figure out, does the limit as x approaches 1 from the left of f prime of x equal the limit as x approaches 1 from the right of f prime of x? So we're going to take the derivative of each part of this function and then plug in 1 for x. So let's take the derivative of each part of the piecewise function. The derivative up here, we take the derivative of each term separately. Derivative of 3x is just going to be 3 times 1. Derivative of 2 is just going to be 0. So we just end up getting 3 minus 0. Over here, we're taking the derivative of a function within another function, so it requires the chain rule. The derivative of your outer function times the derivative of your inner function. So the derivative of your outer function, derivative of ln of something is just 1 over that something, so it's going to be 1 over 3x minus 2 times the derivative of my inner function, which would be 3x minus 2. So we take the derivative of that. We just said over here, the derivative of 3x minus 2 is going to be 3 times 1 minus 0. So it's just going to be 3. So we take that 3 and multiply it to the 1 over 3x minus 2, and we get something that looks like this. Now, these look like they're not equal, but if you recall, we're evaluating the derivative of each part of the piecewise function at x is equal to 1. So over here, there is no x. So we just know the derivative of this part of the piecewise function at x equals 1 is 3. Over here, there is an x. So in order to get the derivative of this part of the piecewise function at x is equal to 1, we need to plug in 1 here. So if we plug in 1 and we simplify, we end up getting that the derivative of both parts of the piecewise function at x equals 1 is equal to 3. Therefore, they are equal equal to one another, so 2 is going to be true. 3 says f is differentiable at x is equal to 1. Well, in order to be differentiable, the derivatives have to match up at x equals 1, which they do, and the function has to be continuous at x equals 1, meaning that these y values have to match up, but they don't. So we automatically know that the function f cannot be differentiable at x is equal to 1 because there's going to be a jump at x equals 1 because each part of the piecewise function has a different y value at x equals 1. So your answer would be 2 only, and that would be c. Now question 7 says if f of x is equal to x squared minus 4 and g is a differentiable function of x, what is the derivative of f of g of x? 
So this is clearly going to test your knowledge of the chain rule because it wants the derivative of f of g of x. We have a function within another function. So let's write out this function f of g of x. So if we know our function f of x is equal to x squared minus 4, then f of g of x just means I take g of x and plug it in over here where I see an x. So f of g of x is going to be equal to g of x squared minus 4. Now, if I want the derivative of f of g of x, I'm just going to take the derivative of this function that I just wrote over here. So how do I take the derivative of this function? Well, I need to take the derivative of each term separately. So first, let's take the derivative of g of x squared. How do I do that? Well, technically, we have a function, g of x, within another function, something being raised to the second power. So I have to use the chain rule here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use the power rule. So it's going to be 2 g of x to the first power. But then I have to multiply that by the derivative of g of x, which will be g prime of x. Then I take the derivative of 4, which I know is 0, and I can simplify this by just writing it as 2 times g of x times g prime of x. Now, where is that over here? Well, clearly d is going to be our answer. 2 times g of x times g prime of x. And you're done. Question 8 says, if f of x is equal to 5 minus x over x cubed plus 2, then f prime of x is equal to what? So for this particular question, we need to take the derivative of a function being divided by another function. So in order to take the derivative of this quotient, we clearly have to use the quotient rule. So to take the derivative here, what we're going to do is we're going to take the derivative of the numerator, multiply it to the denominator, then subtract the numerator times the derivative of the denominator all over the denominator squared. That is the quotient rule. Now let's go through and take the derivative. So here, derivative of 5 minus x, I take the derivative of each term separately. The derivative of 5 is going to be 0. The derivative of x is going to be 1. So we get 0 minus 1. Over here, the derivative of x cubed is going to be 3x squared, and the derivative of 2 is going to be 0. So 0 minus 1 becomes negative 1. 3x squared plus 0 is just 3x squared. I then distribute this negative 1 to the x cubed and to the 2, and I distribute the 3x squared to the x and to the 5. I then need to simplify this further by distributing this negative. This is probably the most common mistake in this problem. I distribute the negative to the 15x squared and to the negative 3x cubed, and it becomes minus 15x squared plus 3x cubed. I then combine like terms, negative x cubed plus 3x cubed is going to be 2x cubed. I then rewrite it in standard form in my numerator, and I see that answer choice C is going to be my derivative, and I'm done. Now question 9 says, if f is the function given by f of x is equal to e to the x over 2, which of the following is an equation of the line tangent to the graph of f at the point 3ln of 4, comma 4? So we want the equation of the tangent line to the graph of this function at this given point. So to get the equation of a line, we need a point and we need a slope. Well, the good news is we already have a point. We just need the slope. So how do we get the slope of this function at a particular point? The derivative. So all we have to do to find the slope of this function at this given point is take the derivative of this function and plug in this point. So let's take the derivative of this function. Derivative of e to the x over 2. We did something like this earlier. We have a function within a function. So we require the chain rule. We got to take the derivative of our outer function first. So the derivative of e to the something is just e to the something. So that's going to be e to the x over 2. But then we have to multiply by the derivative of that something. So the derivative of x over 2. x over 2 is just the same thing as 1 half times x, which we can take that 1 half out front by the constant multiple rule and just take the derivative of x, which is 1. So 1 half times 1 gives you 1 half. So it's really just one half times e to the x over 2, which is one half e to the x over 2. That is our derivative. But this is not our slope. This is the derivative of this function, which allows us to find the slope of this function at any given x value. So all we have to do is take the x value that we want to find the slope at, plug it into the derivative, and then simplify. So e to the 3 ln of 4 over 2. How in the world do we simplify this? Well, this is technically the same as 3 halves times ln of 4. Now, we can use a property of logs here in order to help us. The power property of logs says if we have a number multiplied out front of a log 
We can take that number and make it the exponent of whatever we're taking the log of. So 3 halves ln of 4 is the same thing as ln of 4 to the 3 halves power. That is the power property of logs. Now, why in the world would we do that? Well, because now we can evaluate 4 to the 3 halves power. 4 to the 3 halves power, remember, anytime you have a rational exponent, the numerator is your exponent, the denominator is your root. So we're taking the square root of 4 and then cubing it. So what is the square root of 4? That's 2. What's 2 cubed? That's 8. So ln of 4 to the 3 halves power is the same thing as ln of 8. Now, this whole thing comes together here because e to the ln, anytime you're taking e to the ln of something, the e and the ln cancel each other out and we're just left with whatever you're taking the ln of. So this becomes 1 half times 8, which we know is 4. So f prime of 3 ln of 4 is equal to 4. What does that mean? It means the slope of this function at this given point is equal to 4. Now we have a slope and we have a point. So we can plug those into point slope form. When we do that, 4 is going to go for my m, 3 ln of 4 is going to go in for my x sub 1, 4 is going to go in for my y sub 1. Now I look, is there anything over here that looks like that? Yeah, answer choice B is going to be the equation of the line tangent to this function at this given point. Now question 10 says the height of the water in a conical storage tank shown above is modeled by a differentiable function h, where h of t is measured in meters and t is measured in hours. At time t equals zero, the height of the water in the tank is 25 meters. The height is changing at the rate h prime of t is equal to 2 minus 24e to the negative 0 0.025t all over t plus 4 meters per hour for zero is less than or equal to t, which is less than or equal to 24. So this says when the height of the water in the tank is h meters, the volume of the water is v is equal to one third pi h cubed at what rate is the volume of the water changing at time t equals zero indicate units of measure well what's the question ask it says at what rate is the volume of the water changing at time t equals zero so this is clearly going to be a related rates problem so remember there are a few steps that go along with our related rates problem the first step is to draw our figure make a sketch and in that sketch we're going to label any constant measure with a number and any changing measures with a variable. So here it doesn't actually give you any dimensions of the conical storage tank, but it does tell you that the height of that water in the tank is h. So it's already labeling that for you with a variable, meaning that the height is changing. And it says in the problem that the height is changing at a rate of h prime t is equal to whatever. Next, the second part of step one is to state all given quantities and quantities to be determined. So let's start by stating all given quantities. What are we given in this? Well, it looks like we're given h prime of t, right? The derivative of our function h with respect to time. So dh dt is equal to this function right here, meters per hour. Now, what are we trying to find? What are our quantities to be determined? Well, what's the question ask? It says, at what rate is the volume of the water changing at time t equals zero? So we are trying to find the rate of change of the volume at a particular moment in time. So the rate of change of the volume with respect to time. So dv dt when t is equal to zero. And it also says earlier in the problem that at time t equals zero, the height of the water in the tank is 25 meters. So technically, we want the rate of change of the volume of the water when t equals zero and h is equal to 25 meters. Now, the second step in a related rates problem is to come up with our equation that we need to differentiate implicitly. So what equation are we going to take the derivative of with respect to time? So remember, our equation is going to be like the Pythagorean theorem, similar triangles, trig ratios, geometric volume formulas. Well, here we're trying to find dv dt which means we probably want our equation to be the volume formula so that when we take the derivative with respect to time, we get dv dt. Do we have a volume formula here? Yeah, it actually gives us the volume formula. So we have our equation already in the problem. That was easy. So now step three is to implicitly differentiate both sides of this volume equation with respect to time. So how do we do that? Well, when we take the derivative here with respect to time on this side, we just get dv dt. Over here, the one third and the pi 
y are just going to be constants that we leave out front. So all we have to do is take the derivative of h cubed with respect to time. So when we do that, we do the power rule like we normally would. So it's going to be 3 h squared times dh dt because we have to differentiate with respect to time, not the height. Now, where did that one third go? Remember, it became 3 h squared dh dt. So the 3 and the 1 third canceled each other out. That's why we're left with this. So now we have two rates being related in an equation. That's why it's called a related rates problem. We then move on to step four, which is to substitute our known values. So what do we know here? Well, we know that dh dt is equal to this, and we're trying to find dv dt when t is equal to zero and h is equal to 25. So we're gonna take 25, plug it in for h, and in our dh dt equation right here, we're gonna plug in zero for our time. So now we have plugged in everything we know. The only thing left to do is solve for dv dt. So how do we solve this for dv dt? Well, we just need to simplify. e to the negative 0 0.025 times 0 is just going to be e to the 0. And what's e to the 0? That's 1. And then 0 plus 4 gives you 4. 24 times 1 is 24, divided by 4 is 6, and then 2 minus 6 is going to be negative 4. We then plug this into our calculator, and we get approximately 7,853.982 cubic meters per hour. Remember, we were asked a word problem, so our answer needs to be in a sentence. The volume is changing at a rate of approximately 7,853.982 cubic meters per hour when t is equal to 0, at time t equals 0. So this means that the volume of this water is changing changing at this rate at time t equals zero. Now question 11 says the inside of a funnel of height 10 inches has circular cross sections as shown in the figure below. At height h, the radius of the funnel is given by r is equal to 1 20th times quantity 3 plus h squared, where 0 is less than or equal to h, which is less than or equal to 10. The units of f and h are inches. The funnel contains liquid that is draining from the bottom. At the instant when the height of the liquid is h is equal to 3 inches, the radius of the surface of the liquid is decreasing at a rate of 1 5th inch per second. At this instant, what is the rate of change of the height of the liquid with respect to time? So based on what the question is asking us, we know that this is a related rates problem. So the first step in a related rates problem is to sketch our figure, which they've already done for us, and label any constant measures with a number and any changing measures with a variable. So they've already given you the changing measures and the variables, which is kind of nice, but they didn't label the constant measure, which is the height of this funnel. It says a funnel of height 10 inches, so we know that the height of this funnel has to be 10 inches. The next part of step one is to state all given quantities and quantities to be determined. So we're going to start with our given quantities. What are we given here? Well, again, we're given that the height of the funnel is 10 inches. We're given an equation that allows us to find the radius of the funnel at any given height. And we're also given that the radius of the surface of the liquid is decreasing at a rate of 1 5th inch per second. Now, how in the world would I write that? Well, the radius is decreasing at a rate of 1 5th inch per second. So it's the rate of change of the radius with respect to time. So dr dt is going to be equal to, since it's decreasing, negative 1 5th inch per second when h is equal to 3 inches. The next part of step one is to figure out what are our quantities to be determined. What are we trying to find in this problem? Well, it says at this instant, the instant when h is equal to three inches, what is the rate of change of the height of the liquid with respect to time? So the rate of change of height with respect to time, that would be dh dt. And we want that when h is equal to three inches. Next, we can move on to step two in a related rates problem, which is to state our equation that we need to implicitly differentiate. So what equation are we gonna use here? Well, in this case, we're trying to find dh dt. And we see that we are given an equation here. R is equal to 1 20th times the quantity three plus h squared. So if I were to take the derivative of this with respect to time, yeah, I could get a dh dt out of that. So we're going to use this right here as our equation. That's easy. They gave you the equation. So now all we have to do then is implicitly differentiate this with respect to time to get dh dt. So how do we do this? Well, when you take the derivative of r with respect to time, you get dr dt. When you take the derivative over here with respect to time, it looks like it's complicated. But when you take the derivative, the 1 20th is a constant that can just stay out front. Then all you have to do is take the derivative of each term here. The derivative of 3 with respect to time is just going to be 0. The derivative of h squared with respect to time, you do the power rule like you normally would. It's going to be 2h to the first. But then since you're taking the derivative of h with respect to time, you have to tack on a dh dt. 
We can then simplify this 1 over 20 times 2h, the 2 and the 20 simplify to 1 over 10, and the h just pops in the numerator. And we have successfully differentiated this equation implicitly with respect to time. Now you see we have an equation where two rates are being related, that's why it's called a related rates problem. We then move on to step four in our related rates problem, which is to substitute all known values. So if this is our related rates equation, we are going to substitute in what we know. We know we want dh dt when h is equal to three inches. So we can take three, plug it in for h here. We also know when h is equal to three inches that dr dt is equal to negative one fifth inch per second. So we can take that negative one fifth, plug it in for dr dt here. And now the only thing we don't know is dh dt. So we can solve for dh dt and find dh dt when h is equal to three inches. So how do we solve this? Well, to get rid of this three over 10, we just multiply both sides by the reciprocal 10 over three, and you end up getting negative 10 over 15. We then simplify that down to negative two thirds. And remember, since this is a word problem, you need to write your answer in a sentence. The height of the liquid is changing at a rate of negative two thirds inch per second when h is equal to three inches. And you're done.